So hello and welcome to another episode of Building Success, a real estate podcast. My name is Nicholas Frank and today I am very honored to be joined by Marcus Scholes, Managing Director at Real Asset Management, and Stephen Fox, Head of Corporate Real Estate Solutions at Cube. Both are now members of the MRI Software family. Uh, thank you both for joining me today. Thank you, thank you for uh, inviting thanks. us, Nick. So they are calling in today from London, and today we'll be discussing something very top of mind for those in real estate, specifically those acting as lessees, and those are the new standards issued by FASB and IASB uh, that changes the governance of lessees and their leases. And I'd really like to dive right into it, and I'll start with you, Marcus. Can you give us maybe a two-minute synopsis of these new lease accounting standards. Yes, absolutely, Nick. So um, last year, in fact, the year before, um, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, otherwise known as FASB, and the International Accounting Standards Board, IASB, um, essentially came to broad agreement that there needs to be some fundamental changes to how leases are managed. Um, essentially, there's two different types of leases. There are operating leases and there are financial leases or finance leases, sometimes called capital leases. Now, the operating leases, as it stands at the moment, do not appear on uh, a company's balance sheet. And um, some people consider that to be um, unfair, as it were, because there's a lack of transparency. So these two accounting standing, uh, standards boards have come together and come to agreement that these operating leases need to be put onto the balance sheet to provide transparency. Um, and that's really, the, um, that, that's really why this, is, this new legislation has come about. So are any of these standards affecting the financial leases in any way? Um, not so much the finance leases, um, otherwise called capital leases. This is really to do with the operating leases. So an operating lease is a lease boiled down in a simplified manner, a lease where the, where the lessor will not end up owning the item, the asset, at the end of the day. So this could be a company car, which is maybe leased for two years. Um, obviously, that's very different to a finance or capital lease, which may be, for example, a building where you've got a, a mortgage essentially for 50 years and you will end up owning the building at the end of the day. So that's the fundamental difference. Now, the the capital leases and finance leases are already on the balance sheet. So the asset associated uh, with the lease is, it gets depreciated and it is on the balance sheet. It's fully transparent for everyone to see. Operating leases currently are not. So it's entirely possible that a company, and I use the term company, but it could be, could be local government, could be um, central government, it could be a not-for-profit organization, has got a significant amount of debt um, leases which are not on the balance sheet and are therefore you know, not visible. Um, so really this is only affecting the operating leases. Got it, so that explains what they're for. Can you maybe explain in a little detail why this has come about, who this is really meant to benefit? Hmm. It's a really good question. Um, anybody who has any financial interest in, in an organization, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just companies, but let's talk about companies for a minute. Um, if I'm an investor and I would like to, I'm considering investing in a, a company in Hong Kong and there's another company that does a very similar business in, in London, um, I, want to, I want to research those companies, I want to find out as much about them as possible. And one of those key things I'm going to look at is the accounts. And I think most people would agree that it's fair and reasonable if when I'm looking at both of those companies, I can see exactly what debt those companies have. And at the moment, it could be, it could be stacked so that the company in Hong Kong um, has a huge amount of debt, which is off the balance sheet, which as an investor I cannot see, whereas the company in London um, you know, doesn't have any operating leases, um, has all of their leases on the balance sheet. Now, as an investor, I'm a bit blind at the moment, and I think, I think the accounting standards boards have realized, well, that's just not fair. Um, and this is, again, not just for companies, government organizations, not-for-profits, and anybody who has a financial interest um, 
in, in those organizations and wants more transparency. Those are the people that are going to benefit from this um, new legislation. Sure, that, that makes sense, Marcus. Steve, I'm going to move over to you. I could see how for many organizations, they'll look at these new standards as probably time consuming. Are there upsides to ben- businesses kind of going through this new process? Probably one main benefit, I think, you know, for organizations, I think this standard is going to be quite burdensome for them, especially over the next 12 months and, and even on an ongoing basis as well to sort of manage data and the, the calculations that, that need to be gone to the balance sheet. However, I, I think there are an, there's an upside for, uh, for organizations as well, and, and that is to get a better handle of their commitments. Uh, uh, property leases for, for certain organizations may have been managed fairly well through a property department. Uh, so, for example, a retailer has probably got a quite a large property po- department and know their commitments in terms of their leases, their end dates, their, their options, how much they should be paying and when they should be paying. Um, but for organizations that maybe don't have as much property or are quite decentralized, um, they may not have a full grasp of what leases they, they've got in the different business units around the world because they're owned by those local departments. Uh, and so this sort of gives a really good opportunity for businesses to, to get better handle on all of those commitments around the globe and potentially set up shared business center functions to, uh, to actually manage these centrally. Um, but even for organizations that, that, that did have robust sort of property management and property lease um, management processes, it would still probably be the, the same scenario that any other types of non-property leases, so fleet cars, printer leases, equipment, um, those type of leases, again, will probably have sat with the local departmental manager uh, and they would have signed the leases to have authorities do so. So they get signed, a direct debit gets set up, and then the lease contract gets thrown into a drawer, into a filing cabinet, and you, know, you have no control over that on an ongoing basis because you, you're not managing the data points against it. You're just paying the lease, and you can end up getting rid of a car and continue to pay the, the, the fleet car lease, not knowing that you actually didn't have the car anymore. So I think that is the one benefit for organizations out of this, this whole process. So, Steve, how will businesses be able to have an easier transition into these new standards what what's that going to look like for these businesses a lot of the reporting standard changes typically impact the finance department uh, and this one is, is much wider uh, because the finance department again doesn't typically manage the data and has no necessarily no control over the data so i think a key uh, part of uh, any project to, to, to undertake IFRS 16 or, or ASC 842 is to get stakeholder engagement and, uh, and get responsibility in different departments to, to really work together to tackle this, this standard, to so go and find where the leases are, um, extract that data, get it into a, into a central function, and then really collaborate both initially in, in creating the, uh, the initial calculations and, uh, and budget uh, impacts of uh, of the lease accounting standards, but then also an ongoing basis as well. So lease data for, for certain types of leases is very fluid. It's changing all the time. You've got break clauses, rent reviews. You've got options on leases that you can take advantage of. And so there needs to be a collaboration of, uh, approach for the data owners to, to make those decisions against the leases and those to flow down into the finance team so they can actually take on board those decisions that are being made uh, and then update the the calculations and the impacts um, for their reporting purposes. So it really needs to move away from just being a finance issue and to all departments that have a a leasing responsibility. Um, I think that's that's the best way for for businesses to, to tackle this. Yeah, and hopefully these businesses are already aware of these timelines and really what it is that they need to be doing and working together to make make this happen over the next couple of months going into the next couple of years and that's kind of where i want to go next and and marcus i'll come back to you um talk to me about the time frame what what deadlines are there for businesses to be compliant with these upcoming regulations uh well nick the new standards allow for early adoption um for all entities Um, but it actually goes into effect for public companies and certain non-profits 
uh, for their annual reporting periods beginning after December 15, 2018. Now, private companies will have more time with the new standards going into effect for the physical year beginning after December 15, 2019. Um, there's a couple of other things to note as well. The, the new rules apply to all lease contracts that are in place on the effective date, and not only to, le to leases that begin after the new rules come into effect. So, you know, time is ticking, and um, organizations really need to sort of get on with, um, with looking into this and, and Get, you know, t taking effect with the, the rules. So what what kind of challenges or obstacles, and this question is really for either of you, uh, can you foresee in kind of the near term with people trying to meet these regulations? Uh, I'll, I'll go first, if you like, Marcus. Uh, I, I, I think data. Data is the biggest challenge here. You know, actually understanding what lease commitments a business has is a huge, huge uh, undertaking that needs to be had. And, and as I mentioned earlier, that, that's not something that the finance people can do alone. They really need to educate the rest of the business um, for them to understand what impact this, this standard is going to have and for them to go off and find all of their leasing commitments. And some of those leasing commitments might not necessarily be uh, something that the uh, business itself has signed up for. It might be something that one of their suppliers has, uh, have signed up for a commitment that is directly uh, resulting from uh, the business that, that, that that's been conducted with them. So, for example, a uh, a, control, a controlled manufacturing environment that's been uh, dictated up the supply chain, and that might class as some element of uh, of leasing commitment for for the business. So, uh, it's really understanding that data and getting re early adoption to go and find those leases, and then starting to to model. Yeah, I I, I agree with. Um... I agree with you. Essentially, data is, is a big issue, um, getting that data ready, getting it scrubbed. Um, a lot of the data at the moment sits in filing cabinets. It's not held digitally, um, and that's going to be a huge problem. Um, a lot of this data is held at local offices, regional offices, uh, and not held um, essentially in a database um, or, or at the headquarters. So there's a lot of groundwork to be done to collect all this data. There's the obvious timeline issue. Um, people as well. I mean, there's a lot of different people that will need to get involved in this project. Um, it's, it's not just the accountants. Risk managers will now need to get involved in this process as well. Um, technology is another, another obvious one. Um, you know, organizations will need to get systems in place. Um, their current systems may or may not be able to um, manage the new legislation. So a lot of organizations are going to have to go to market, uh, evaluate systems, and then go through the process of getting uh, that data into the system, get it tested uh, all in time. So there's quite a few um, different pieces that need to come together in order to, to have a successful result. Um, so those are the main challenges that, that I can foresee. There's only, there's only 12 months left as, as well, so that timeline is really, is really sort of getting short now as well. So I think that is a, that's a, a big challenge for businesses and, and, and handling yeah, I mean, are are there any other things you'd like our listeners to be aware of when it comes to these these regulations, the ASC eight forty two and IFRS sixteen? I, I guess Marcus alluded to it uh, in in his previous one, and I think it's the role of that the technology can play in in helping organisations tackle this post two thousand and nineteen, but then also um, sorry pre two thousand nineteen and also post two thousand nineteen um, to actually do your sort of initial budget uh, figures for, for the impact uh, and, and getting a system to do those calculations for you. Uh, and then also getting a platform that can really help business collaborate and the different departments collaborate on, on the project and so making sure that the data managers or data owners are actually owning the data, they're updating it periodically. And when any of those changes impact the, the potential calculations, that the finance team and the finance lead and the reporting manager that's responsible for for the, um, the, the lease accounting, IFRS 16, ASC 842, are aware of those changes and then can do the appropriate recalculations through a system. Uh, and then there's also the, the, the data controls that are there as well, actually getting auditability on, on data point changes and, and SOX compliance and things like that. And that's just not going to be possible if you're doing that through a, an Excel spreadsheet uh, you really need to have those controls and that that, um, that accountability for for the data and the uh, the calculations that have been done. 
Yeah, absolutely. And looking at the opportunities, um, this new lease, well, the new lease regulations can be seen as an opportunity to upgrade platforms that uh, may previously have lacked investment. Um, typically, uh, revenue generating systems within organizations um, get a lot of the budget and the time. Well, due to this, the new legislation, this can actually um, give the accountants and, and property managers the opportunity to secure funding to upgrade or replace legacy systems um, because they have no choice but to become compliant um, and they will need systems in place. So, you know, the impetus for change, um, you know, is in the air and that, you know, that could well be uh, an opportunity. Well, Marcus, Steve, I certainly appreciate you, both of you, taking the time to join me today. I'm sure the, uh, the coming year will be exciting times for both of you. <laughs> we can't wait. <laughs> For us uh, here at Building Success, please feel free to reach out, leave a comment on iTunes. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe. And until next time, we will see you later.